And if you think about it, the fat has to go somewhere. So in the model, if we're blocking it from entering the fat cell, it's got to go somewhere, right? And in essence, it's sort of backing up. Metabolic flexibility, the answer for you to be able to burn fat and build more muscle faster than you ever have before. And this is why I bring on Mike T. Nelson, which does an amazing job on laying out what really matters for when it comes to you being able to get in great shape, especially if you're stuck not being able to burn the weight off. If you're really not being able to build the muscle that you want, build the body that you want, metabolic flexibility can be something that is of very high importance to you. And you're gonna be able to discover how to make this happen in this episode. Hi, I'm Chris Dufay and you're watching Breaking Success. This is the show that gives you the answer to build the body, the business, and the life that you love. Mike, thank you so much for coming on to the My Body Words podcast. I'm pumped to get you here because we're talking on a topic that I've been trying to delve into for quite some time that I know you are the mix master Mike when it comes to this. So I just <laughs> want to say a huge thank you for taking the time out for you today, mate. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on here. I greatly appreciate it. It's uh, always fun to do podcasts like yours and uh, have a good time chatting. Okay, let's just get straight on into this, Mike, because I know I've been following your stuff and it was actually, it was only a few days ago that I listened to you on another interview and I was like, Mike, I've got to get him on because I touched base <laughs> with you before and I was like, no, I was like, this has to happen. Yeah. I've got to get him on. This is so good. So who is Mike and why he's so phenomenal? Uh, well, thank you very much for that. Um yeah, so I've been doing the kind of fitness thing for a while, for studying research in that area for almost coming up on two decades now, actually. Wow. Um, so I did an undergrad, Bachelor of Arts in Natural Science, minor in chemistry, decided I want to go the engineering route, just did two years postgraduate stuff, and then did another two and a half years, did a master's in mechanical engineering, uh, more on the biomechanics side. So after that eight years, I swore I was never going back to school ever again, which lasted a whole two years. <laughs> um, started a program for a PhD in biomedical engineering, got about four years into it and uh, realized I spent all my free time even more reading exercise physiology. I was taking physiology like, you know, at 500 level classes just for fun, basically. Um, so I eventually then switched to the PhD program in bio, or I'm sorry, I switched from biomedical to the PhD program in exercise physiology, kinesiology. So it took me seven years to complete that, which is kind of a arduous task. Um, and during that time, I did some research on heart rate variability and then also metabolic flexibility, which we'll talk about coming up here today. And been working with clients in person and online since 2010. Yeah, probably even before that, actually 2006, now that I think about it, almost 10 years. Um, so that's been really cool along the way just to see, you know, because a lot of stuff you can read about in research, but applying it is a different thing. And then after you apply some stuff, figuring out, ooh, this is interesting. I see that this happens. And then kind of going back to the research and see, is there a reason for that? Mm -hmm. uh, so I like kind of doing both of them and, mm -hmm. and sort of bridging the gap between the two. This is what I absolutely love about what you do because you, you are bridging the gap, which I think is so important for myself because I'm not on so much of the research side, I'm looking at so much of what mm -hmm. people like yourself are doing and trying to be in the trenches, but you actually being able to be in the trenches at the same time and see what's going on on an application level is so important because this is at the end of the day what's needed. How do we actually apply what we're learning from the science when it comes to it? Okay, enough jibber-jabbering for myself. Metabolic <laughs> flexibility, this is something for the last couple of years has really interested me. So let's start from the ground level up and let's build on in. How would you define metabolic flexibility, Mike? Yeah, so the simple definition is being able to use the right fuel at the right time. So if we simplify it and we just go with the main two fuels, which would be fat and carbohydrates, um, both of them are actually really good, although the, the fitness world wants to kind of be all on one side or the other, which I'm sure we'll get into, but it's getting better, which is nice. Um, so if you actually go do high-intensity weight training type exercise, the main fuel for that is carbohydrates. So you want the ability to use carbohydrates to their fullest degree during that time. 
However, the rest of your day, when you're sleeping, you're just kind of walking around, you're doing pretty low intensity activities, you actually want the ability to switch and use fat as the main fuel source during that time. So for lower intensity stuff or even your resting metabolic rate most of the time because it's resting, you actually want that primarily to be fueled from fat. So metabolic flexibility is how well can you use both fuels and how well can you switch back and forth between the two when needed. Okay, this is fantastic. The, when I kind of started wrapping my head around this, I, was, I saw, let's go, traditional physique, bodybuilding, people getting mm-hmm. in shape. They have, I have a bulk, so I get fat trying to put on muscle, and then I do a cut. I'm going to lose muscle while I try and lose body fat at the same time. And then when I kind of like looked at it and I was talking with other uh, really high quality coaches, it was like, okay, what if we actually applied more of a zigzag method? So rather than these big, okay, I'm going to gain, mm-hmm. I'm going to cut, what if it was really small? But then again, rather than just tightening that macro level, what if we looked really micro and said, okay, in a day, what could we do and how can we switch those fuels? And say with myself, and uh, please, you can tear me apart and you can say I'm wrong <laughs> which way. I'm totally here to learn. But with myself, the morning time, like I usually fast until about – 11, 12 o'clock, not really because I want to be intermittent fasting, but also just because Mm -hmm. I can focus on work, like things like this right now, I'm not worrying about food, but also I I can be focusing on fat for fuel being in uh, this time of the day. And then as I weight train later in the day, I can transition into more carbohydrates to be able to go into those weight training workouts. Or even, sorry, today I'm doing kickboxing at about midday. So I'm going into that with no carbs. Um, so I can focus on more fat for fuel as well. Is that a good way to look at it? Uh, I think so. I mean, I think my bias is if a, as a general template, I think you need to look at, so I like your example of, so if we're setting up a training program, right? We've got the macro cycle, meso cycles. We have all these fancy words for periodization. Yeah. And in essence, all periodization is, okay, what are we trying to focus on for X period of time? So I think doing the same thing with nutrition, I think, is a good idea. Um, So if we throw out calories for now, because calories do matter, which I'm sure we'll come back to, Mm -hmm. um, you can look at it across a week spectrum. So I'm a big fan of days that are weight training. Those days are generally higher in carbohydrates. So I'm trying to fuel weight training. I'm trying to have the highest level of performance because we know even for a pure physique athlete, that that's the main trigger for hypertrophy, strength, size, things of that nature. Um, But let's say Tuesday, so let's say they weight train maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday, simple example. Um, Tuesday, maybe that's a lower intensity cardio day. We want some type of recovery. Um, So I may even have them do a longer fasting period on Tuesday. So my goal on Tuesday is primarily to teach the body to use fat as a fuel and to be in a slight caloric deficit. Now, you can take those concepts and you can even do like what you did and combine them into the same day if you want. So maybe I have a 12-hour fast overnight. So obviously, I'm not eating anything at that point. So our insulin levels are going to go down. That's going to push the body to use more fat as a fuel. Obviously, I'm cutting out the amount of calories during that time too. And what I find from a compliance standpoint is that for most people who are healthy, that's relatively easy for them to do that. I found that periods of fasting are easier for them to do than extremely low calories for a period of time. So I've had people do like an all day 19 to 24 hour fast. And most of the time, after a period of four to five weeks, they can do that pretty easily. Now I've tried doing an extremely low calorie diet on that day. Uh, That just seems a lot harder also from a compliance standpoint. So what I like about the approach uh, you mentioned too is that you're kind of maximizing what you want to do for different parts of the day. And I think that's overall a good idea Um, because I think too many people have an awesome training program, have a cool nutrition program, and they throw them together and they don't think about how they're going to interact with each other. Right. They're not combining them with any sort of thought as to what is the main goal of the program and then what is the main adaptation that I want from this program. So by all means, if you're, you know, if you're going to be a power lifter and you want to maximize strength and size, you don't care so much about body composition, then yeah, you know, eat tons of carbs, eat all the time, get as much as you can, recover as much as you possibly can. 
Uh, if you're more of a physique athlete, if you start straying too far from that, you know you're going to have to come back down to get back to where you were before. So you probably don't want to stray too far out. So you're kind of riding uh, that area of, you know, I want to get, say, off season, but I don't want to get too far, you know, into the off season and end up, you know, 50 pounds above where you were before. This is so fascinating to me. Okay, so when it comes to the switching of the fuels, what is it that we can be doing um, through training, through nutrition, through supplementation, through lifestyle? What are the factors that you think are actually going to work when it comes to helping someone switch those fuel sources? Yeah, I think the main one, uh, so I look at like everyone talks a lot about hormones and I think hormones are obviously important. But I think in general they get overrated um, because in essence they're just messengers to a particular stimulus. And if you look at how much control we have over most of them, uh, supplements, drugs aside, that kind of stuff, it's not really that much. Um, So I always look for, okay, we know we've got hormones on kind of both sides of the equation. And if we look at how many sort of counter-regulatory hormones we have to insulin, we find that there's a whole bunch of them, all right? So if we have insulin on the left side, you think, okay, insulin, cool. What does the opposite of insulin? And you've got epi, norepi, you know, cortisol. You can just go down the list, yeah. possibly leptin in a long time course. Yeah. Um, but you have multiples. You have a whole bunch of them. Would you put and then glucagon you think, in that field as well? Yep, I would throw yeah. glucagon in there too, yep. Um, and actually, leptin is probably the only one that maybe mirrors insulin. Okay. Um, so there really isn't anything that does the same effect as insulin. So that would tell me that insulin is probably pretty important, right? Um, and then you look at, okay, but do we have any control over insulin? And we actually have a lot of control over insulin via dietary intake. So not only would I argue is insulin important, needed for survival, there's a whole bunch of great functions in the body, not much of a backup system to replace it, and it's very much under dietary control. So we know that if you eat a bunch of carbohydrates in a healthy person, your insulin levels go up, trying to get the carbohydrates out of the bloodstream into various tissues, in, you know, from the liver to the muscle to maybe little bits converted to fat, that type of thing. Um, and then if we don't eat, we have insulin levels go down, and that actually pushes us more to use fat. So I think insulin to me is better thought of a fuel selector switch. So I think I stole that from Jeff Bullock. So that when insulin levels are high, it's pushing us to primarily use more carbohydrates. When insulin levels are low, it's primarily pushing us to use more fat. So we can kind of direct the fuel usage a little bit by looking at insulin and then looking at foods that generate a higher insulin response, which is primarily carbohydrates. Uh, some proteins can, you know, spike insulin a little bit. Uh, fats in general uh, don't really have any effect in, in on insulin. Again, those are taken in isolation. Now, when it comes to, um, let's call it supplements and insulin sensitizing nutrients such as cinnamon, fenugreek, these kind of things, do mm-hmm. you find these actually a beneficial route to go down, something that actually matters at the end of the day? Uh, my general thought right now is that I'm not convinced that they make any damn difference. <laughs> yeah. um, Sorry, can I just so the, interject the, with something real quick? Yeah. Because also this is yeah, yeah. something I was thinking about was if you're bring like insulin sensitivity, is it tissue specific insulin sensitivity that this is Correct. helping as well? Like obviously weight training is a great glucose disposal agent because you're helping it Mm -hmm. go into the muscles. But what's like, is the insulin sensitizing nutrients, is that actually helping fat cells? Yeah, and that's where it gets really complicated. So if we back up and we look and go, okay, so if you come to the lab, how would we measure sort of your insulin sensitivity? We can pull blood glucose, we can pull blood levels of insulin, We can take sort of a combined score, which sometimes is called a HOMA score, H-O-M-A. We can do, so the lab I was in, I didn't do any of these, but my advisor did a fair amount in the past, is what's called a CLAMP study. So in essence, you've got an IV in your left arm, IV in your right arm, and we put a crap ton of insulin in one and a crap ton of glucose in the other one. And we kind of raise these up and we kind of see what happens at a whole body system level. 
And that's useful to determine, you know, if you're healthy or diabetic or what you're doing and that type of thing. But again, as you mentioned, that's a whole body level. So that takes into account fat, tissue, liver, muscle, pretty much everything. So if you think from a physique standpoint, right, and you think, oh, okay, so what if I could magically control all the carbohydrates to only go to glycogen and not go to fat tissue, right? Because in a perfect world, that's kind of what you would want. Ooh, can I get them to increase glycogen and not, quote unquote, spill over? So the, the process of actually converting carbohydrates to fats, what's called DNL, uh, de novo lipogenesis, it's primarily in the liver. And what's fascinating is if you look at the human subject studies that are on that, and they did it with a radioactive tracer, uh, DNL in most active humans is actually not that high. It's not as high as what we would expect. Now, if you look at uh, little rodent studies, it's, their DNL rates are extremely high which is why high fructose corn syrup is really bad if you're a mouse. <laughs> yeah, debatable if you're a human, right? And, and Unless it's high dose. I'm not saying it's the most greatest thing ever right, to consume, yeah. but it's more neutral than I would say maybe negative, dose dependent. Um, so a couple of years ago, I looked into this pretty heavily as my thought was, okay, so let's say we have a magical insulin sensitizing agent and it can go in and direct... Um, things to go to muscle and not direct them to go to fat. And there is some animal work, this hasn't been done in humans yet, that is able to do a receptor blocker. So they can genetically create a mouse. And what they did is they created one that did not allow the mouse to do DNL very well. In essence, it did not allow the mouse to take fat and to stuff it into fat cells. Can I just quickly now, ask, what was the mechanism behind that? I think it was a genetic knockout model, if I remember. Yeah. Okay, so, so I think it was a, yeah, and there's, you know, there's like CD36, and there's all different, you know, fat transporters and all different stuff. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's a limited study. Um, but my thought reading that was, oh, crap, this is amazing, right? We're going to have this lean jacked mouse, and we're going to have, you know, a, a mechanism that maybe humans could use at some point. Um, unfortunately, what happened was, the fat had to go somewhere and it started building up around the liver. And so their triglycerides spiked super high mm -hmm. and they started showing signs of uh, fatty liver disease. And I'm like, oh, oh crap, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you think about it, the fat has to go somewhere. So in the model, if we're blocking it from entering the fat cell, it's got to go somewhere, right? And in essence, it's sort of backing up, right? So the analogy I've used is if you're at this like, super obscure secretive club or whatever and there's a line around the door you're basically the doorman's only allowing a set number of people in yeah. right um but what happens the people start backing up in the street right they don't magically leave yeah. they just start backing up so if you're not allowing the fat to enter the fat cell in essence it just starts backing up and starts screwing with other tissues yes so the next thought i had then okay so maybe that's a bad idea we need more data. But how would you, if you're the physique competitor, how would you try to get leaner using some of these principles? And I think the rate limiting step is actually fatty acid oxidation. And that I think you want throughput through the whole system as high as possible. Mm -hmm. right? So fatty acid oxidation is just simply burning fat as a fuel. So if you have a fat cell, right? Here's your fat cell. We control how much fat comes in, which is storage. And how much is released when the fat is released, process called lipolysis. Yep. The fat flows around and hopefully for body composition purposes, the fat's burned as a fuel. Boom, okay, it's kind of negative, it leaves the body. Um, if it's not burned as a fuel, it gets what's called reesterified and basically enters another fat cell somewhere else. And if you look at some of the human subject studies from like the early 90s, from the, especially the Gatorade Institute, that fatty acid oxidation appears to be the rate limiting step in humans for using fat as a fuel. So even humans who are not very healthy, they will liberate or tear down a whole bunch more fat than they will actually burn. So if we go all the way back to our insulin thing, I think the problem with insulin sensitizers is, one, it's whole body, yeah. right? So if you're, let's say, a diabetic, 
and you've got a problem with insulin and glucose management in your body, it's to your survival advantage to shove that in as many tissues as you possibly can, right? Because we know high amounts in the bloodstream will be toxic. Now, that doesn't happen in a healthy individual, but, you know, unhealthy people, that can happen. So your body says, okay, I'm wired for survival. I don't want blood glucose in the bloodstream to get high. I will do everything possible to make sure that that does not happen. Mm -hmm. If I have to take and convert some fat, cool, I'll do that. If I throw it in glycogen storage in the liver, cool. If I throw it in glycogen in the muscle or possibly the brain or wherever, get it the heck out of the bloodstream, throw it somewhere else. And it seems like it will do everything possible to make sure that that happens. So if that's true, then I think increasing the body's ability to use fat as a fuel or sort of turning up the, the temperature and the amount on the furnace is more of the answer than trying to control exactly where it goes. I love it. Okay, I love Assuming it. you have the same amount coming in, right? Yes, totally. Okay, no, I love where you took that. So that That's gets... a long-winded explanation. No, 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 it's great. <laughs> totally. I really appreciate that. That was really good. So I guess the next question that leads on from that is how do we turn that gauge up then? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a big fan of a couple of ways. So one, obviously weight training, right? We know weight training, although primarily using carbohydrates for fuel, helps us increase muscle mass, which is related to metabolic rate. It's not as high as what people want to believe, but it's under direct control. We do know as you get older, you do tend to lose muscle mass, um, and that can affect your metabolic rate. Granted, it's you know it doesn't happen until you know probably your late 60s or somewhere around there, much later than what people think, but it definitely can happen. And we know that weight training does burn a lot of calories. Cool stuff. I don't know if I'm completely sold on the effect of EPOC for exercise, which is probably a separate subtopic. Uh, but we know weight training in general is good. I think the part that gets sort of swept under the rug a lot of times is uh, NEAT. So non-exercising activity thermogenesis. In essence, how much do you sort of spontaneously get up and move around? And in most people, NEAT is higher than the amount of exercise. So if we look at the total amount of calories that you burn per day, an average person, half of that is just your resting metabolic rate. So just how much energy it takes to keep your lights on. If you did nothing all day and laid around with your eyes closed, that's half of the calories you burn on a daily basis. Um, NEAT is probably the next biggest part, exercise, and then uh, thermic effect of feeding, which is pretty small. Um, and what you see is that it's cool now with like little watches, you can actually measure step count. Uh, so in all my clients, I try to get a step count uh, from them. And that's a pretty good rough approximation of how much they're moving around during the day. So I'm a big fan of, yes, program exercise. Yes, do all that. Yes, your nutrition matters. Um, but especially if you're a physique competitor and you're trying to cut your calories to you know get in really good shape or very lean, so you want to be on stage, things of that nature, because your body senses that, uh-oh, uh-oh, energy is going down, your NEAT a lot of times will plummet. Yes. And that's the part that people, it's very easy to not track that. So for a lot of clients, I'll say, okay, you know, get up, I want you to do 3,000 steps fasted in the morning. And it's not so much that that's going to magically get them shredded in, you know, four weeks or anything like that. But part of that is just maintaining their normal physical exercise. Mm -hmm. um, a second part in that too is if you look at the other way, so if we take people and we sort of spontaneously start overfeeding them, uh, right? So this study was done in the Mayo, I think like 10 years ago now. Very fascinating study. So they had subjects come in, not necessarily athletes, and they said, okay, Monday, boom, you guys get 1,000 more calories per day for eight weeks. And their thought was, okay, 3,500 calories, boom, these people are going to gain you know, around, I think it's like 14 pounds over the course of the study. People come back, fast forward to the end of the study. They looked at it, and yeah, some people did gain 13, 14 pounds. A couple of people only gained two pounds. And they're going, well, what, what the hell is that? Um, but remember, in the study, they did not control for exercise. So it was only a feeding intervention only. And what they found was some of the people, when you started overfeeding them, they did not move more at all. Their butt stayed glued to the couch. Nothing else happened. Some other people, however, started spontaneously moving around more. So their NEAT actually ratcheted up. 
right? So your classic kind of hard gainer, you know, things of that nature. And yeah, they did gain some weight, but only about like two pounds, right? So you have almost a you know 10 to 12 pound difference between these groups over you know about two months. A uh, study was done by Levine. Um, so I think to me that's fascinating because some people will do it unconsciously and not know it, and that can go both directions, both up and back down. I 100% concur with what you're saying right now because I know when I've died and trained to low depths of body fat, like I remember I'd come back from some morning cardio and what do you do? You slump on the couch, you're like, Nothing. oh my God, I'm done. And <laughs> Thank actually, God I it's a, over. <laughs> exactly, absolutely. And it was actually um, just to, again, back up what you said, I interviewed Dr. Scott Stevenson and he's brought up something really yeah, interesting in we'll our, yeah, so he was actually in our interview, he was like saying, hey, like this is a fancy cool method of um, how to get lean as you're cutting down is get a hobby, like get a hobby mm -hmm. as you're doing something, fix up a bike, fix up a car, go make a home garden, do something that's going to uh, get you moving because exactly what you're saying is like, look, if you can kind of subconsciously just get yourself moving more, that is going to be a huge amount of the equation. I love that. So good. Yeah, totally. Like I'll make the distinction with clients of exercise versus recreation. Yeah. Right. So formal exercise, we're going to track it. We'll know exactly where you are. We'll know your performance. Recreation, eh, go play tennis, go yeah. play basketball, go walk the dog, you know, just move. And yeah. if you want to use a Fitbit or something to track that, that's cool. But just, you know, go out and then do something physical. And I love like, you know, get a hobby, do something else. Right. I've always found like whenever I really got into my surfing, I was just suddenly just getting leaner. Like within days, I was just like, what is going yeah. on? And it was just like, because I was just churning through so much energy, bloody trying to consistently paddle back out for a couple of hours. It was hard work. Okay. Now you brought up something before, Mike, which was really good. Was obviously we've talked about the hormones. How does the calorie equation come into this as well when we're talking about metabolic flexibility? Yeah. So... So a lot of people think then, oh, well, calories don't matter at all. Well, calories obviously still matter, and given enough protein, calories are probably still the number one thing. Yes. Um, because so a couple of things. So it's technically the second law of thermodynamics, not really the first, but people don't want to argue about that. Um, the thing that people forget is if we take someone and we shove them in a metabolic chamber. And we measure everything that goes in, you know, the exact calories of their food, how much they move around, how much exercise they do, all these things that's really expensive to do. We find that calories in, calories out works perfect every time within standard air. The hard part is that that's a really cool way of measuring kind of mechanistic type stuff and verifying something. But people don't live in a metabolic chamber. And what you find is that, like I was saying before, the amount of calories that you eat affects how much the output. How much you output affects uh, hunger, other hormones of how much you eat. So you've got a feedback loop, in essence, going both directions. And where it gets really kludgy is that some of those mechanisms are basically unconscious. So for example, like the neat example, things of that nature. So people will be like, so exercise is one, right? Um, some clients, you probably had this too. If you have them exercise too much, they get so damn hungry that they can't cut their calories anymore. Mm -hmm. So paradoxically, over the last almost year or so, I've actually started having people exercise almost less sometimes yes. when they get really yeah. lean. Um, and I noticed this a couple times. I went on a, a Kuiper vacation in the Dominican this past July, and I did some, you know, a little bit of formal exercise and just some body weight stuff, real light stuff, nothing crazy. Couldn't find a local gym down there, but I figured, ah, screw it, I'm not going to worry about it. Went kiteboarding every day. Um, came back 10 days later and I'm like, shit, I lost like five pounds. Oh, wow. I'm like, I wasn't trying to, you know, but I realized that, oh, when I remove formal exercise, I'm not nearly as hungry. Yeah. So, and obviously I'm in a different environment. I have different cues, things of that nature. So I think where the short sightedness comes in is everyone looks and goes, ah, okay, exercise. If we just burn more calories, that'll be better. Yeah, it's better as long as you're not replacing those amount of calories. Yeah. And you have to take into account how the person feels, um, how hungry they get, all those other things. And on the other side, if you get too aggressive and you start whacking their calories super low, super fast, one, you're going to run out of runway at some point. 
Um, and then two, if their exercise performance starts dropping, they're physically doing less work in the gym. And a lot of times they don't measure how much work is actually being performed in the gym. So you're trying to find this kind of, you know, nice sort of happy medium of, cool, your exercise performance is still going pretty good. You don't feel like you want to gnaw your arm off after you're done. Yeah, you're kind of hungry a little bit. And in a perfect world, we'll keep calories as high as we can for as long as we possibly can. And last thing on that, too, is that some people have different rates of adaptation going down and back up, mm -hmm. right? So some people, if you cut their calories, let's say by 500 calories overnight, right? I'm not saying you should do this, but let's say if you did, they may start ratcheting down pretty fast to try to match that, right? Because the body at, at the end of the day is survival based. Um, other people, eh, they don't seem to downregulate as fast. And again, a lot of the downregulation is just probably in neat and other mechanisms like that. Yep. Um, and on the other end, right? So if you do like a reverse dieting type thing, you know, may be able to get back up to a super high caloric amount pretty fast. But if they tend to match cutting on the way down, they may drop really fast also, right? So for example, um, I know a guy who probably I think it was about four months after a show, and he was back to almost like 4,000 calories a day. He wasn't stage lean, but he was still pretty lean. But he's also an extremely fast adapter. So he has to take his diet really slow because if he starts cutting calories at the normal rate, he's going to basically chew through those 4,000 calories really fast. Yep. Or someone else who doesn't adapt as fast, they can you know, they could be great for you know six eight months or something at a relatively aggressive rate. Um, so it's also the amount that you get to, the amount that you burn, and how fast your body adapts to it going through the process. I think that's a really good point of bringing up the individualism of how someone needs yeah. to tinker with what's going on because obviously I think so many people are looking for a bit too much of a cookie cutter idea of what needs to happen where that just will not work. Now. When it comes to, I, I'm kind of envisioning, all right, the listener right now, there's going to be a lot of people going, okay, this metabolic flexibility, this all makes sense, this is fantastic. A lot of people's sticking point, their mental belief is, I'm just not good with carbs. How do yeah. I actually start to use carbohydrates and obviously use this concept of increasing or uh, improving my metabolic flexibility? How would you answer that? Yeah, and there definitely is changes in the body's ability to use carbs. And when I say that, it's not like, oh, oh, I didn't eat carbs for a couple of weeks. Ooh, I can't use them at all. I mean, your, your body will still use them and will still process them. However, for performance standpoint, will it be able to use them to the highest degree? And there is some changes in that realm, right? So if you look at some of the ketogenic diets, so ketogenic, moderate to low-ish protein, I mean, by bodybuilding type standards, super, super high fat probably less than about 50 grams of carbohydrates per day. So very low carb, high fat diet. Now that does increase the body's ability to use fat as a fuel, but because the carbohydrates are so low, if that's taken out too long without many carbohydrates coming in, if you refeed those people carbohydrates, their performance doesn't seem to match before, right? So if you look at the, the classic thought was, and I had this thought years ago too, um, for endurance people, right? You're saying, okay, so if I can teach the body to use more fat as a fuel for this long endurance event, awesome. So how would I do that? Mm, let's see, maybe I want to be really aggressive. I'll throw them on a ketogenic type diet. Boom, I dramatically increase the amount of fat I can basically run through that system. And then they saw, oh boy, like speed and power performance sucks when they needed it. So like, oh, okay, no worries. We will refeed them carbohydrates the night before the event Boom, they'll have carbohydrates on board. They'll have all these nice training adaptations with fat. And it's pretty close. But the thing that does the monkey wrench in it is that because of that long period of fat adaptation, the body starts losing the ability to fully use the carbohydrates. So if we drop a needle in your leg, we may be able to pull out and look and go, oh boy, glycogen is back to the level it was before. But can you take that glycogen and use it for you know speed and power, basically glycolysis, at a super high rate like you did before? And in most people, you see a, a slight drop in their performance. Um, that's probably moderated by a PDH enzyme changes and things of that nature. Um, 
So now the thought is, ooh, but what if we kind of give carbohydrates back once in a while kind of during that training? So just enough so we don't see that loss in um, carbohydrate adaptation. Um, so two other things, and I'll actually answer your question. Um, intermittent fasting does not seem to have those changes associated with it. So my bias is I will use a period of fasting to push the increased use of fat to whack out a bunch of calories and to keep it relatively easy for the person. Yeah. And that does not seem to mess with carbohydrate use. Now, that may be because it's such a very short period of time, too. You're not going to fast for, you know, two months or something crazy like that. Um, so that may have something to do with it. There's a couple of mechanistic things that doesn't seem to alter PDH enzyme, things of that nature. Um, so all this goes back to, I think, your question of uh, what do you actually do if you have someone who is not as sensitive to using carbohydrates? Um, so what I do with those people is I'll have them take uh, like a carbohydrate type solution um, initially I'll do a test at breakfast. So I'll say, hey, okay, here's a carb solution with some protein, have that at breakfast the next morning and tell me how you feel. Yeah. If, you know, 20 minutes into it, they're, you know, want to be face down on the table. Okay. They're probably pretty sensitive to that. Um, so then you got to be a little bit careful, but assuming they have you know, a pretty normal response, you can start to add them back in. Um, if the response is borderline, I'll have them add that solution about uh, halfway through exercise or even at the end of exercise. Interesting. Yep. The thing you have to watch is if you know someone gets, you know, kind of woozy or whacked out of their head, you know, don't have them do it when they're doing squats or exercise. <laughs> and, you know, don't be stupid, things like that. But, you know, that part of the equation, not talking about right now, the reason is that during exercise, we have an upregulation in GLUT4. Right, so the body's ability to basically take and vacuum and hoover glucose out of the bloodstream into the muscle. Uh, we also have uh, non-insulin mediated uptake of glucose just from the working muscle and the things associated with exercise. Uh, we also have lots of all the other counter-regulatory hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, things of that nature. So your body is pretty well used to using carbohydrates at that point. Yes. And then I look for a change in their performance or their RPE, so rating of perceived exertion. Most of the time, what you'll hear is, oh yeah, about halfway through training, I started you know, drinking the carb solution. Oh, I didn't, the rest half of my training was actually better. It didn't feel as hard. You know, my performance didn't kind of drop off as much. And then once I do that for a couple of weeks, I'll add a little bit more after training, and then I'll basically sort of kind of prolong slower amounts out over their diet and kind of slowly uh, ratchet them back up. Yeah. Um, but I found that around training, and if you're really, you know, super cautious after training, right, if you're worried about safety, which I totally get, um, that appears to be the best time, and people don't really have the same sort of symptoms at that point. Yeah, it's like, um, like the way John Meadows puts his philosophy around nutrition, yeah. especially carbohydrates, is let's say you're training at 4 p.m., okay, you're going to put your carbs, let's call it, the 3 p.m. meal and 5 p.m. and maybe even during your session and the way he mm -hmm. does it. And I think it's the simplicity is the beauty is as you add carbohydrates, you can add them to your meals going uh, further away. And then as you start cutting them, you start cutting them from further away from your workout yep. and start bringing them back in a beautiful way. And it absolutely does work as well. Okay. Yeah, no, I totally agree. When it comes to, let's say I was really geeking out for a while a little bit ago, um, taking my blood sugars mm -hmm. uh, every like postprenatal one hour after every meal and mm -hmm. I was always making sure, okay, like just because it was completely testing. I had the Excel spreadsheet out. I was like, I ate this much <laughs> and this was what was going on. Nice. This is the results. And it was kind of like a really an end of one, okay, what's going on with myself and how am I responding? I'm getting actually back into it now being like, I'd be really interested to see what was happening because I found some foods I would tolerate really well, others I didn't. I found some restaurants, like I went and had a, a chicken and broccoli dish at like a local place just down the road and I found my blood sugars went up after I went, that's wrong. Like. I actually didn't have any carbohydrates from it. Anyway, I found out they were actually adding sugar syrup to the broccoli. I was like, yeah, not going back common. there. Yeah. So I found that. <laughs> when you're looking at, say, blood sugar levels, especially being able to have that switch to go between 
um, fat and carbohydrates and vice versa. Is there a certain level that you're looking at in a broad strokes realm? Uh, not really. I, I look at the um, ability to do blood glucose as an overall marker to see exactly what you said. You know, what foods don't match what you would think, mm. right? So, for example, that meal, I've had broccoli and chicken a whole bunch of other times. Hmm, it didn't spike my blood glucose as much as that one. So, what's different about that one that I may be missing? Yeah. Um, the other part, too, is that I think an AM blood glucose, when it's fasted, yes. is a really good marker for just general health. And also what I've seen, so I've done that. I've, I got the kit still here. Uh, I did it off and on for probably like six months. And I've done it in some clients, too. And what I noticed to my surprise was that stress and sleep made a massive yes. difference in my fasting blood glucose. Oh, yeah. And I kind of knew that. Had a baby and, and like, went read up. read all the research. Yeah, and because I first started doing it, and like the first measurement I got was like 115. I'm like, oh crap, this is horrible, you know. And I was just finishing my PhD, stressed out of my mind. And then I said, oh okay, so started working on that, graduated, all that kind of stuff. And what I noticed is, because I'll measure my heart rate variability too, mm -hmm. that if sleep quality drops for a couple nights, stress goes up, uh, fasting blood glucose goes up also. Mm -hmm. um, so. I think that's also another uh, good marker just to see what's going on. Um, the other part, too, that I'll look at, you can do a poor poor man's sort of oral glucose tolerance test. Um, I've done this in the fast with uh, like Vitargo or a fast-acting carbohydrate solution. And what I wanted to see was, will it spike my blood glucose, which you know I would want to a little bit before training, and then will it sort of like automatically just flat line back down? And what I saw was it would go up to about 120 or so, hang out there, and slowly come back down. So I think you also want to pay attention to the how far it goes up. Yes. And then also how long. Yes. Because in a perfect world, if we gave you like a huge 7-Eleven Slurpee with no ice with just a crap ton of sugar, we would probably want your, your glucose to go up to some degree. But we also want your body's ability to handle that and to clear it and then actually see it drop back down without having any symptoms. Mm -hmm. So I think we also have to look at sort of the pharmacokinetics of that also. And last thing on that too is um, when I was at the lab, we had some data looking at blood glucose and insulin also. So in the subjects, they were borderline obese. They were borderline type 2 diabetics. Ran this huge study. And I'm looking at the data and some of the subjects, you know, blood glucose was like, you know, 123, 124. Not great, but compared to the people at 160, pretty good, relatively speaking. Yeah. Um, but when you looked at their insulin levels, the guy who had the 123, his insulin levels were sky high. Wow. And you think about it, he probably had a longer disease progression. And his body is going, oh, my God, I'm going to whack out as much insulin as I possibly can to keep this blood sugar under control. Mm -hmm. And I think as the disease progresses, we do know that that amount goes higher and higher. At some point, you know, the pancreas can't keep up and that sort of thing. So the caveat to all that is that, you know, just be aware when people are doing blood glucose, you're literally only measuring a snapshot of the glucose in the bloodstream at that time. Uh, you don't have insulin um, data. So measuring it, I think, under different conditions is cool and, and can help kind of um, guide you. Um, but, you know, just keep in mind that you don't have an insulin number there either at that time. Yes, exactly. You're seeing kind of like half of the picture. What about, um, you said obviously a morning um, glucose test fasted. Mm -hmm. What would that number be just for the listener and just for obviously for the yeah. as well? What would that number actually be you would like to see? Uh, the number I personally like to see is... Probably in the 80s, yeah. you know, I think there's a trend like anything in fitness, right? People are like, oh, yours was 88. That's too high. It should yeah. be like 73. I'm like, 73? That's insane. Um, you know, can some people get to a 73? Yeah, yeah, maybe ketogenic diets, other things like that. Um, but in my experience, yeah, 75 to 80, even low 90s once in a while, I don't get that worried about. What about too low like what like there was sometimes i was getting like a mid 60s yeah yeah so i think that's something's weird then right because i have seen numbers like that assuming you remeasure it and then it's accurate yeah. um 
most of the time I find those people, if the number is too low, they're extremely sensitive to carbohydrates. Yeah. Right. So if we take some, sorry, just like to give some context, that was when I was nearly at my leanest and obviously just very on point, like really controlling everything. That was probably, it was like really when I was in the depths of geeking out and tracking everything as well. And that's like, I did the test. It was like 65 and I was like, okay, I'll retest that. That's got to be wrong. And then I was like, oh, okay. And it was consistent as well. Yeah, what I have noticed is I've played around with like a ketogenic supplements and things of that, like a ketogenic salt or, yeah. or different uh, compounds. Course, yeah, and those will dramatically drop your blood glucose because yeah. your body is switching to using ketones. So I'm, I'm very curious in people, like in your case there, um, if they have the ability to measure ketones, if they're measuring, measuring any ketones that are showing up, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Um, and then also sort of what is their sensitivity level? You know, if they have some carbohydrates, do they become super sort of sensitive and have weird responses to them? Last question, because I know we've got to wrap this yeah, up with time no as worries. well. But th- I think this is probably just opening up Pandora's box to possibly <laughs> just get you back on and do a second one. But especially yeah, when it comes back on to whenever you want. ketosis, um, do you find a lot of what's going on about the ketosis realm right now in relation specifically to physique um, is not giving them the whole picture? Mm, I would say yes, especially for physique sports. Um, because the thing you have to remember for a physique sport, again, my bias is that you want to make sure your performance stays as high as possible for as long as possible. Because that's the driver of holding on to as much muscle tissue as you possibly can. Um, obviously, there's other ways of you know decreasing calories, things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first question I always ask people is, okay, if they switch to a ketogenic diet, do they have any marker to make sure they're actually in ketosis? Because if you're in that gray zone where you're transitioning and your ketones are not very high, your carbs are super low, everyone across the board I've ever seen, they feel like crap. Mm -hmm. And I think people tend to stay in that zone a little bit too long thinking they're in ketosis. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, and that, that just destroys people if you're in there. Um, so once you verify that you're in ketosis, then I want to know what is your performance. So if you're primarily doing heavy lifting with long rest periods, yeah, I think you can probably get by with that and your nervous system can handle that. You're probably okay. Mm. Now, if we really start pushing, you know, kind of the glycolytic type thing or, you know, 30, 60, 90 second high intense, you know, repeated bouts, things of that nature. Yeah, most people tend to, to kind of crumble away at that point. So then you have to kind of go, okay, so performance may drop a little bit more, but I feel satiated and I feel like I can do a lower calorie approach pretty easy. Yeah, yeah that may be a fair trade-off, right? And that's an individual thing. But I think too often people go, ooh, ketosis, woo, I'm going to go in ketosis. And then don't track their performance. Yep. Everything feels harder. So they assume that they're doing more performance in the gym, which most of the time they're not. And that they just don't look at any sort of markers. Because mm. they go, well, exercise is really hard, man. I must be training hard. Mm. Yeah, your, your volume may be less than what you were doing before. So you're physically doing less work, even though it feels harder. So I want to know what is the amount of work you're actually doing, too. That is a fantastic point because I think you nailed that. I think so many people would be in that psychological state telling themselves, oh, I'm working so hard because of my perceived mm-hmm. rate of exhaustion is higher yeah. where it's actually like no you're training like a handbag right now it's just you're <laughs> suffering in the gym yeah yeah okay okay yeah. i tell you what okay i know we've got to wrap this up and i really appreciate your time but i would love to get you back on i think would also yeah, would be for fun. sure anytime offline you and i can do a little bit of a chat i want to kind of like especially in the ketosis and kind of combining ketosis obviously with the physique world as well i want to guinea mm-hmm. peek myself so maybe if i'll guinea peek myself for a little bit then we can jump into the interview so we've got some context about what we can wrap around but i just want yeah, to say a sure. huge thank you mike now obviously i've absolutely loved this i know the listener will where does the listener go right now to make sure they learn everything that's going on with oh, you? sure yeah thank you very much for doing the show I greatly appreciate it awesome questions too um, yeah, then you can just go to www.miketnelson.com, M-I-K-E-T-N-E-L-S-O-N. And if they want to drop me an email, they can just email me at drmike at miketnelson.com. 
just put at action podcast and it may take me a few days or sometimes rare cases a couple of weeks to get back to people but i'm usually pretty good at getting back to most people so uh beautiful. yeah this is the site drop me a line beautiful i really appreciate that and i'll pop the link into the show mike thank you so much mike really appreciate it really looking forward to talking again soon Yeah, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. This is fun. Now, this is where I want to make sure that you get the most out of being here. And I want to hear from you. So if you've enjoyed this episode, click like and make sure I can send you the new episodes each and every week. Be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Also, I really want to make sure that I'm giving you exactly what you need. So comment below. I want to know what you're going to take away from this episode and the best conversations after every episode episode always happen in the Breaking Success Tribe. I'll pop a link below for you to join the free group so you get access to the guides, the live streams. I'm in there answering your questions personally each and every day, plus you get all the episodes as well. So thank you so much for being here and joining us. I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the next episode.